Ba -ba -ba -ba. Hi, I'm Seamless, and today is Friday, and I'm apparently starting a recording. And it's, uh, it's time for How to Bass, and this is today I'm going to make this sound. Really botched that intro, but whatever. So this was a bit of an experiment for me. Um, what I thought to do was that I was going to make th three different bandpass sort of types. Ones that have slightly different bandwidths, others that have slightly different uh, steepness settings inside FL's EQ2, which represents how like sharp and slope the curves are. Resonance still matters, but like the sort of the size of it is determined by that. There's it's somewhat interesting for how this works because they're in the order section, which is what governs this. There's steep and then there's gentle. But if you, you saw me scroll through these up here, because that's what these dots represent. The dark ones I think are steep and the small ones are gentle. But notice that like the middle one is still the widest one for the same EQ setting. Number two here is what I've been using for years to do things like the bandpass double notch stuff. And the reason why I like it that way is because when it's in the two mode, um, it bleeds a bit on the outside. So even though it's passing only these sections, you can still hear this. And if you compress it hard enough, you can get it back. So you can um, you can work, you can use a sound like that and you can use it to have the, the quality of the motion of the modulation, but you can still bring back the, the other harmonic content so that you're not like completely just only that one section, which rarely works that well. However, it does work pretty well when it's distorted, which is what every single one of these starts you know, doing. It gets it's the, the filter, and then it's distorted, and then some various processing. This one has a flanger on it, this one has a chorus on it, and this one has a vocodex on it. And it's all coming together to be EQ'd. And I, this one also has some modulation on it. This is a low pass, uh, a, little, a little thing on it, and then what's up? Oh, it's the resonance of the low pass, that's right. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, and then there's a separating out into a sub, and then it gets compressed, and it's being modulated all together with this envelope controller with the one um, X thing moving it, but then they're all coming out to be different various parameters to do a deal, but it's still macro, they're just one thing, so it's all moving together. So let's talk about what the thing is in the beginning. Mostly in the beginning, it's just a square wave. There's some unison involved, and there's some other shenanigans, but it's largely just a square wave. It wouldn't sound that different if I just switched this out for it's a square wave. What's happening in here is that we have, um, on A part, I've moved it to the square side of things. Usually I do the whole detune 2 thing, but in this case, it's just the square side of things. Um, it doesn't look like a square, but it is a square. And like the way that these tamper things work, if you're confused by that, is that um, this is the window by which we can tell per harmonic, it's the harmonic level of the entire series. And like, this graph gives us every single one of them, all 512 of them. And on the square side... We have this, like, and this, this is flat line, which is saying that every single one of them has, like, the same sort of relative level. And it is somewhat relative, because even without changing anything, the lower harmonics, like, the fundamentals are literally louder than the higher harmonics. It's just that we're not seeing, we're not seeing, like, the, the slope applied to it. And then, um, not that there is a slope, I'm just saying that it's relative. So, and then this side is the square side, and this is coming off with every other harmonic, because that's what a square wave is. A square wave is just the same series as a saw wave, only it has every other harmonic instead of every harmonic. In this case, it's all the uh, odd numbered ones. Um, and so that doesn't, it doesn't matter that these waveforms are not actually solid waves or square waves, but they, just, they have this, the same harmonic content, and then thus the effects of them are being taken out uh, are like that. If you've ever used the square eyes function inside Serum, this is largely what that is. And on this side, I have um, something that is on Detune 2. The difference between Detune 2 and this is that this will, this is, this will actually like, turn down certain harmonics so like this harmonic is still there but it's off what detune do does is that instead of turning them off on that side of the timbre it moves them into the next highest position which puts it in the correct position to be a square wave of course you can go all the way to 16 and that's not anything at that point but it's at number two it's a square wave um it's, it's important for like if we have harmonic based effects like what i'm doing in the local eq here which is boosting particular sections of it and you can see it kind of moving around up there that if i turn it off on the square wave or rather put it back on the square wave you can see how that the position of it is still there versus if i do this it gets still there but then if i go to number two here on the d tune it is a square wave now but it moved everything so that this is this essentially got trend this got just doubled across the spectrum because in length rather because of the movement of harmonics i would take a second to explain that whenever i use that as a thing just because i feel like it could be kind of confusing so this local EQ, like the purpose of it is that this, this is putting sort of formant stuff in there, and then this is just having an effect on what the bandpass does. Um, when we're using really thin bandpasses, like 
the harmonic content is so sparse that we can hear it like pass over individual harmonics, especially when it's really thin. Like I'm not, I'm not actually trying to have you hear, I'm just showing it to you so you can see that the harmonics are rather f few and far between in comparison to literally double it when it's a saw wave type sound. On the unison side of things, I brought down the higher frequencies like completely, so like, there's not any unison happening on the higher frequencies except for the, for the usage of phase. The phase doesn't get reduced when we reduce the pitch setting, which is what this is. So this is saying that like while I have the pitch going on, it's only applying as such according to these particular frequencies at this particular time, because that's what Harmer does. Same thing on B, it's mostly just flat. Like B is very untouched when it comes to being just a saw wave or square wave rather. And it's just there to kind of like lean together with this guy so that like it's it's not totally busted up by its by its unison. Um I'm not doing anything else on this. Actually on the advanced tab, I did turn down ramping so that like the notes are just on when they're on. You can actually see when I do this that I change there's a couple other parameters that were changed, like the harmonizer and the phaser, but they're not actually on because I didn't like what I did with them. So first step is these three these three guys here. So let's start let's do let's do the bottom one first because it has a Vocodex in it. And you know how much I like Vocodex. So that's the first stage. That's the you using a bandpass filter to filter the, th the things that we have going on in there. And then it gets distorted using the wave shaper. Now you can see that it's being controlled here. The, the, the first, is this the first one? This is the first one, actually, the first one I did. Wow. So here's the um, profile of the X control controlling um, that particular bandpass. You can see that it's only that, that particular section. I don't actually go all the way. You can see that like the uh, automation is at various levels, and that's because when we're doing it this this thin, like every step will have a very different tone. So like if I wanted to be maxed at this level for a particular phrase, it could be at that level, but I'm not going to change that in here, if, in case, just in case I want to go higher. Uh, then it gets distorted, and this is using wave shaper. I'm also modulating the pregain of the wave shaper so that it's because it gets really trashy at like low values of of like the low amounts of it. And so that's what that does. And given the bandpass does the, 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 makes this feel the way that it does, especially when it gets distorted, it's very formative, which means that it's particularly easy to get something interesting out of it in Vocodex. I've been thinking, well, that wasn't that interesting, and that's because this is just a layer. And we'll totally get into why, like, the, some of the challenges of layering things like this when, when we split up stuff like that. But um, it's uh, a little bit interesting what we're having with that. But what's happening in here? Um, I tried to release time all the way down, but I still have minimum times on, which means that it's probably somewhere up here in reality. Um, I have my the the. <laughs> The bandwidth up at pretty high, which like it, it's giving us that kind of cloudy feel. You might be thinking that it's actually sounded a little bit better with a lower value because it, it more accentuated the, the formant kind of nature of it. And you'd be right if this was the main thing in the sound, but as it turns out, it doesn't really sound that great when it's a compare. It's like combined with everything else. Um, 84 bands, order three, a little bit of the filter fatness kind of reduced. Normally, it's pretty fat, which sort of reduces that kind of glassy effect, but uh, I wanted to have a little bit of that going on. Or is it always on this side? I forget what side it's always on, but uh, I, I, I believe it's off by default. That's my alarm going off, which has nothing to do with this video. Move the pitch around, but in the bandwidth and in the and the modulated pitch shift, I did move around with the graph. This graph setting, much like in Harmer, is the same things as these knobs, only it's these knobs uh, parameters per band. Which, even though it's not, this isn't the synthesizer, this is just still just an effect. It's, it is a vocoder, which is splitting everything up in the bands, which is not unlike what Additive what this is, does. It's these, except that these aren't bands, and these are just individual frequencies that are just individual sine waves. Um... This is a section of frequency, and it was just we just have control per band. So this is why it's not like too, super similar, but in terms of like how we can look at like a, like a parameter change, because we can have global settings where like we can move this up and down, and it'll be what it is. But we can also sort of change what its shape even is when we move it up, move it up and down, which is actually still true and present for lots of parameters that are inside Harmer. Fun fact: that vocoder, Vocodex, that was called a Vocodor, Vocodex, uh, was made a lot earlier. Van Harmer. In fact, when was it made? 2009. My God. All those years where people weren't sounding like Skrillex. Was it Harmer done? I, uh, where did, uh, can I not get that can? Get ready for this weirdness. Bleh! Ah! 
Uh, well, uh, actually, here's, here's I don't know if you knew this about about Harmer, <laughs> about Harmer. But if you grab it, we look at that. That's just hilarious. Uh, what the hell is AVX stand for? I know what SSC two is. Uh, there's no year on here. Well, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sorry about that. So then that gets EQ to kind of control it a little bit. And it's sort of this EQ is interesting and, and the layering w w it involves how the layering works, but you see like it's really not a lot. It's got really only the frequencies that like it, it is like obviously it, like the things that have like that form and control, that, that, that sort of speechy nature. And like, because like the, the, the darkness of it, like there's not, not a lot of high frequencies, there's not a lot of bass frequencies are mostly taken back by these two EQs from the previous, like the other layers. Puts into a master EQ, which uh, has that little pass on it, which we'll explain when we talk about the rest of these and then it goes to the compressor. But let's talk about the rest of these. So this next dude starts similarly. But given that it's not, it's not gentle or steep, it's just number two, it's very light. And then that gets distorted. This distortion is, it was a little bit more complicated than what it is now. I actually reduced it because it was a bit of a mess. But um, whenever I make shapes like these, it, it sort of might seem like it might be something deliberate on my part, but it's usually pretty random. I just kind of move it around until it sounds okay. And like, that's kind of all you need to know about that sort of that sort of distortion. There are specific things you can be doing with a wave shaper, but I did none of them here. I put it on a chorus. <laughs> It's very light. It's got that kind of phasery thing going on. I have wet only on because I am having the wet signal on and the dry signal on two different things, and they're being blended together to go inside this EQ. So the chorus actually just want to understand what these parameters do, and delay and depth. Delay is it's just delay because that's what how choruses do their thing, and then the depth. I want to say is the pitch change, but it could be. A phase change on the delay to make pitch change. Technically, it doesn't really matter because the effect is that this changes pitch. And then both of these parameters have an LFO attached to it where it changes that value. So it like can subtly move over time. Also has this cross cutoff, which uh, only applies the chorus effect on particular frequencies according to either a high pass or a low pass filter. In this case, it's set to 500 hertz, which is pretty, it's pretty high. It's not, not a lot of lower frequencies, but I mean, the sound is being pretty high pass anyway. It has a stereo, but I'm not using it, and an LFO also on the stereo. And then uh, you can change the LFO's si like waveform type. It could either be side waves or apparently other kinds of side waves. And then the wet only. It's a very simple plugin, just like the flanger. The flanger is just about the same same kind of deal. Only like uh, choruses, flangers, and phasers work on similar processes, but some of them are very specifically different with important ramifications that get a similar class of sounds. Um, and then I did the EQ, and then it goes into there, and that's the end of that. And then this top layer <laughs> begins its life as a similarly thin bandpass, but just slightly thicker, which gets us a similar sound distorted. <laughs> Both, all of these, by the way, have their bandpass controlled by the, the envelope controller, and then also the um, pregain. And the pregain is actually the same controller for all three of them. Uh, they're all coming back on number four here which looks like this. And then EQ. I talked about the flanger. Like, uh, the, the wet is pretty far down and dry is pretty high up. But this effect is really, like, obvious. And I'm not always, like, a fan of it. I just turned it off. But I like it as, like, a light layer, which is why it's in there like that. It causes subtle phasing, which uh, sort of interacts against everything else. So now let's talk about interacting against everything else. Um, is it making sound right now? That oh, was probably a phaser. Yeah, you can see it moving. The phaser, because it ha similarly, it has it has an LFO in it that moves it around, and because it's causing phase change while it's doing that, it um, I guess that's, I really don't know why it's doing that. Now that I think about it, it could be that reason. It could be that it's changing phase and it's creating a little bit of level, but um, it's uh, it's motion. The motion that it causes creates sound to be made. Or I guess it just makes sound anyway. Wow. Who knows if I know what I'm talking about, dear God. Point being is that the, the flanger uh, creates a little bit of level, but like it's almost completely imperceptible. 
Unless you compress the shit out of it. Which I am. Now, here's the thing about layering this stuff, and this is going to be a little bit deep because it involves thinking of EQ in a very different way. And to understand this, we have to understand what linear phase and minimum phase are inside EQs. Now, I'm sure you've heard the term linear phase. Linear phase is the opposite of what this is. This is minimum phase. Minimum phase uh, is how regular filters and EQs do their job. And I'm pretty sure analog hardware ones also do it this way. I don't actually remember how. And by remember, I mean I never actually knew how they work at like a technical level. I do know, however, that digital ones, at least, at least a specific EQ, is done and used with minimum phase. Um, what happens is with the filters is that it, to, in order to make what's happening happen, it does it by changing the phase of frequencies around the cutoff. Um, and it creates phase cancellation or um, interference, constructive interference, one of those or the other, to either cut or boost or pass or whatever it's going to do. Um, that being said, if you've ever used a, a really tight filter like this, or even just a regular low pass with a high resonance, and you whap, like, whipped it around like a lead or something, and you heard it change pitch, it's because it is changing pitch. If you change the face of something while it's playing, it does change its pitch. And specifically, what pitch it changes to is, is determined by how fast that change is happening. Um, this is actually the fundamental way that FM works. This is how digital FM functions as was created by the Yamaha DX7. You just call it DX7, right? Yeah, I just like got a huge brain fart. I was just like, did I just call it something that I wasn't called? But nope, it's called DX7. Um, point being, the, the reason why this is all important is that when we're layering all the stuff together, phasing becomes extremely important. And the phase profile of stuff is kind of hard to control if you're doing this kind of crap to it. And then also, like, any amount of these EQs. So... Especially because we're compressing, we're multi-band compressing it, which means that like whatever I take away here, whatever I take away here, whatever I take away anywhere else, is gonna get brought up and brought back pretty hard depending on what I do with it. Like the low, not so much because I high passed uh, this last filter here to bring in a sub, so like it's it's just gonna be at the level it's at, and then I don't need to worry about it. But the mids and highs, and also the master, are compressed pretty heavily. I actually did pretty traditional compression with this. I'm not actually I'm not doing a lot that like is unique to Maximus, except for what I'm doing on the highs. This is particularly gonna be kind of cool. Um. But like while this is while this is happening, like the the way that you the way that like I at least suggest that you think about EQs has to change, because every one of these little changes that I'm making is altering the phase profile a little bit, and what that means is that even though this is a pretty stable sound coming out of here with not a lot of changes, it's not it's really not that far away from just being a square wave. Um, like the high end, for example, is just going to come out and it's going to clash, and you will get phase cancellation as a result of what changes are happening here. So like when I'm playing the thing, and I'm I'm trying to deal with I'm trying to deal with um the high frequencies sort of stability of it. So like like this one has I think most of the high frequencies coming out of it. This one's being brought down, and this one is almost completely brought down. But them being down it doesn't actually directly contribute to the the high frequencies coming down or not, because this changing the phase a little bit means that some of them are going. To, to cancel and go away, and some of them are going to boost and come back, regardless of the fact that we brought this down. So when we, when we make changes to the EQ, we're at, we have to really primarily not think about the literal level of particular parts of the spectrum, but the phase effect that's having on things, in, and, and then in conjunction with the, the other two um, EQs, like, I mean, well, you know, six in total, and then the seventh on this one, but since everything's going through this, it all, the phase change is happening together, so it's not much of an issue. Is that when the phase change is separate from, uh, you know, things that this phasing against, that this becomes a problem. This is actually one of the reasons why uh, sort of, like, professorial engineers who are always telling you to be very, very careful about your EQ, tell you to be very careful about your EQ. The whole minimum phase concept means that especially for stuff that has impact, like snare drums and kick drums, that if you screw with it too much, you will lose that impact because that impact is 100% the result of the phase and the, like, the timing and the phase of how those, like, that particular impact occurs. And it's, when it's even and straight across all it, frequencies according to its original movement, then it's fine. But the second you, you mess with the EQ, some parts of that go away, or at least if you mess with it too hard. You can get away, obviously you can get away with that. I'm sure plenty of you have been using EQs forever, and so like you, you're just either thinking to yourself, that's not really a that big a deal, or you're thinking to yourself, oh, you know, that makes a lot of sense because that sort of shit has happened to me constantly and been a problem. Um, 
it's not it really isn't that big a deal but only only if you're doing like light eqing and like this is pretty intense eqing and like you've seen me do some pretty intense eqs on some stuff um but like <laughs> there's a pretty big difference between sort of mixing EQ and sound design EQ. And the problem is, is that because we're doing it like this, this is really a combo of both. The sound design EQ, which is really just filtering, happens at this part part of the stage. But then we are, I am mixing this together to sort of be a thing um, all by itself. Um, and that means that I got to take care of these layers in such a way, which is why, like, I'm not putting a big focus on, like, the form and D characteristic of this because of the way that these three layer together. Like this guy. <laughs> It's got this flanger on kind of hard, actually. Did, did I screw with this? Actually, it doesn't matter because it gets, it gets, uh, yeah, whatever. And then beyond the phase, the, the weird phasing this, like, or I'd rather because of the weird phasing this, the level of things actually starts to matter a lot, too. And not even just in a mixture sense, not even just that one of them, they get like more sort of accentuated or not. Like you, you might be thinking, well, isn't that just what happened? Didn't we just hear that happen while I was doing that? And the answer to that is sort of yes and no, because while we're hearing it sort of increase and in that this thing is having its influence imparted upon it, it, its influence isn't identical to what it was when it was by itself. It isn't just a literal mixture of just linearly levels on these things. This is that like we have to think about how we're mixing not just the levels, but also the phase relationship of everything else together so that it all kind of adds up. But I mean, I think I'm pretty sure I didn't track latency at all, which means that like, yeah, like this, this guy actually moves along a little harder than everything else. But I can fix that by just turning the compressor off. Bam. Look at that. <laughs> of course, that sounds like that. <laughs> compressor is adding a little additional latency by 153 samples, which like, and this is adding 73 samples, which I think is because of the elevation delay, which I can just get rid of totally. Yeah, it's a handy, handy thing to do, by the way, inside uh, Patchers, just to look at the latency by turning it on here. You could also dis disengage or re-engage, whatever other kind of thing in there, just in case you didn't know that. Um, I don't believe there's any kind of PDC inside inside Patchers, so that you're really entirely responsible for that. Uh, <laughs> I am also still using the the oversampling on every single EQ, which is like a little bit, little bit process intensive. Which, when we're using Patcher, matters a lot because Patcher, everything in Patcher is by default made into a single thread. Versus things that we do inside the mixer are multi threaded quite awesomely. So, even though we go into Harmon, we go into Advanced, and we see things like, oh, I'm threaded. It's not actually threaded. This is all one thread. And if, the, if, you've, got, if you've got fast enough cores, then it's not a big enough, that's not really that big a deal. It's like, you know, my computer is pretty ludicrous, so it's not that big a deal. But um, if you do too much in here, it, it'll use up like all your CPU. I remember what my mixture of this was when I first started the started the video. That's okay though. I mean, this does kind of sound like a lot of, a lot of my a lot of the older stuff that I've, I've been doing. But um, there is actually one last thing that makes this pretty cool that makes this a little bit important. That sounds a little better. Actually, it's because I messed around with the gate, the, the bandwidth on this. There it is. So. Yeah, you can kind of hear on how on like um, on the sort of on the beat that there's like this kind of sharpness happening to it, and not just on the moments that are sharp, but like right here, for example, that there's like this whip happening. That's just like fuck, and there's like a big impact, uh, not on the note and not on where the peak is. Like, what's going on in there? Why is that happening? Well, that's happening because of how I'm handling the compression. So. At the low end, not doing anything because I have I have a separate sub coming in here. This is just a square. It's low pass. I have uh, I'm automating a low pass on it inside here, and then there's low pass to here, just doing this deal. But I'm automating this here to give it so that like part of the part of the motion is kind of imparted on the sub, so that it feels like it's part. It's just actually just there, you know, related to the, what the automation is going on. But 
um, on the low and the mids. Actually, I'm, I'm monitoring the low end too, which was almost entirely unnecessary, but uh, the band is cut up open enough that there's actually more harmonics in here than just the sub that I have in here. Um, which is, I did that because like I like how it sounded, not because I'm like making a mistake. Like, I didn't completely separate the sub. Really, the only rule of thumb about separating the sub is that you push the high, the high pass as high as you can until it starts to sound bad, which is different for every sound. Um, on the mids here, however, and what I've done here is that I looked at the input level and like uh, this is what it was, this is sort of how that was going on and like a little hard to see but kind of what's happening here is that this has a level that like right around like right around here is kind of where the cutoff of like i want most everything that goes above this to be kind of a little bit more on point so what i did was i just just brought it down pretty hard like this is really just average compression this is just like, here's the threshold here's my ratio that's the end of it this is actually even the get loud enough to interact with this corner to make it anything interesting. It just is just happening this way. And as a result, it kind of pushes everything up pretty high. I have really rather fast release times and the, and the sustain is kind of low. So that means that it's pretty tight. And then on the higher frequencies, this weirdness happens where I put the point over here and, uh, this is actually expansion at this point. It's not even really compression. It's compression at the, uh, you know, in a literal sense because we are reducing dynamic range, but it's expansion because it's going up instead of going down. And what this graph is saying right now is that if any level at all uh, appears inside this band, it is immediately brought to at least whatever that point is, uh, minus 11 dB, and then it can start to sort of like interact with increasing or, or decreasing the level. Um, I have the attack. That's I have an attack on in this though, so it's not completely perfect. And so this means that like I have a I have a low pass filter on this last one here because the high frequency gets kind of out of control, especially for the lower levels of automation. And this means that it gets like the the input here. You can actually see it happening. What? No. So the green here is the output, which is the result of what we're doing, and then the the, the white is its original level. So you can see, like, pretty much any time there's any interaction with these frequencies, there's a big old snap. And this, uh, and then, like, when there is nothing, there is just nothing. And it actually is pretty clearly nothing when those happens, and that's mostly because of, uh, I even, yeah, that's because of the low pass filter. This band, after all, is pretty high. I had the setup here up to, up to about 5K. Um, so that's why... Like right here, it goes low enough that it's not interacting with it, but then right around here somewhere, it just barely interacts with that particular band and it gets poof, brought the hell back up there, which is giving us this high frequency snap. And so part part of the interesting automation of this, because it feels like I'm doing really intricate stuff with the automation, is because of that compression. And also because of the macro nature of it. Like the, the actual positions that I've chosen were mostly, again, at random, but parts of that were also things that I did, like I came over here. So you can see how like different levels of intensity actually have pretty big impact on uh, the sort of the modulations motion. There's a word I wanted to use. I don't remember what it was. Yeah. And um, so you get lots of expressive, expressive this out of it, but that's mostly entirely because of that thing that's going on in the compression. And then on the master, it's again, just doing pretty regular compression. Like the way that you're, you, you do this with regular compressors is that like you, you set your threshold, you set your ratio, and then you set makeup gain. And inside Maximus, that's the post knob. So we have the, pre and post and you can see how on the mids I, I brought that up pretty high and that's because uh, I compressed it down pretty far so I had to bring it back up to be at the same relative level. I didn't need to do that in the highs though because I'm expanding and I didn't need to do that again in the master because again I'm bringing it down as such and the reason why I'm doing this instead of, instead of doing like sp ma maximum specific ones are because I, I wanted to see if there was like a tangible difference and there was a little bit of a difference depending on what we're doing but then again I went and did this which is it's kind of a, a maximus thing to do. <clears throat> On top of that, uh, where you set these bands matters a lot. 
because you can kind of think of this of this as like detection range that it's detecting particular motions in here and then when it does it's just on and the farther down you go the more the more it detects <laughs> So, like, there is actually a, a bit of a tonal component to what happens depending on where this cut is, which isn't something that I usually think about a lot, but at least in terms of individual sounds. And like in the mixing sense, I'm paying very close attention to what the bands are doing because um, there's lots of, like, especially for mastering, like, you know, kicks and snares and whatever live where they live and you want to separate them appropriately. But for individual sounds, we, we have to think about completely different things, which all come down to totally subjective concepts of what we like in our tones. But just wanted to let you, let you sort of think about that and have that in your mind. Anyway, uh, this patcher will be available to download in the description of this video. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.